And Ms Maguire is joining us remotely. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Refugees are people who have fled war, violence, conflict or persecution and have crossed an international border to find safety in another country. Defined and protected in international law, the 1951 Refugee Convention is a key legal document and defines a refugee as someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everybody is entitled to seek asylum. Here in the UK, we should reflect on how our involvement in various conflicts has destabilised many of the regions and countries that folk are having to flee from, but that probably needs a whole other debate. So today, as we focus on refugees, let's simply ask ourselves, if we were fleeing for our very lives with a right to seek asylum guaranteed under international law, how would we wish to be treated at the places where we sought sanctuary? If we or our families, friends or loved ones had caused to flee from our homes, towns or villages, taking only what we could carry and in fear for our lives, how would we want to be treated? Would we want to be shown compassion, care, decency and humanity? Would we expect to be able to work and contribute to our new community? How we treat those who need our help defines who we are and what we value as individuals and a society. As, me as well as a moral obligation, we have a legal one to provide refuge to our brothers and sisters who find themselves in that situation. Moral and legal obligations that the UK government is abdicating for its planned offshoring of asylum processing. Bitty Patel, Boris Johnson's Home Secretary, has described the deal, which will cost at least £120 million in the next five years, as a first-class policy. The United Nations does not agree, stating in their analysis of the scheme that it was incompatible with the letter and spirit of the 1951 Refugee Convention. They also raised a host of potential problems, including a shortage of interpreters in Rwanda, a risk of discrimination against LGBTQ people and a lack of capacity to process hundreds, if not thousands, of diverted asylum claims. Officials said that there would be 130 people on the first flight to Kigali. After dozens of successful legal challenges, only seven asylum seekers were taken to the airbase. Can't say exactly how many people will be on the flight, Liz Trust, the Foreign Secretary, told the media, but the really important thing is we establish the principle. The principle of rich countries buying their way out of international obligations, trading in human misery by paying poorer countries to take vulnerable humans somewhere where they may well be at further risk of harm, is not a principle I share. I agree with the UN's assessment. It's wrong. It's also expensive and ineffective in meeting the UK government's stated aims of preventing people crossing the channel. As the minister pointed out in opening, safe routes will do that as will removing financial incentive for traffickers by disrupting the market for humans, in particular women and girls trafficked for prostitution, and we do that with a robust justice response to men who purchase sex. The UK government's approach will not work, and when even former hardline Prime Minister Theresa May of the Go Home vans is criticising the plans on the ground, I quote, on, of legality, practicality and efficacy, I hope that Scottish Conservative colleagues in this ch chamber will be given cause for concern and do what they can by either speaking out privately or speaking out or speaking privately and using whatever influence they have with their UK government colleagues to change this inhumane, ineffective policy, which is shaming us all globally. We could do so much better, presiding officer, as well as a simple democratic case for our nation restoring its independence. There are a myriad of specific policy reasons. A different, a different approach to foreign policy and migration is one of those. With independence and full power over migration policy, we can build asylum and immigration systems geared to meet Scotland's needs, needs which are different from the rest of the UK. We need more working age people here. We can have a system founded on fairness and human rights. With the Scottish social security system, we've shown that that's possible. An immigration system which fulfils our moral and legal obligations and bringing benefits to our nation is achievable for Scotland, but we must have the full powers that only an independent nation has to do that. In closing, let me welcome people who have sought refuge in Scotland over the years, 
and recognise the contribution that those who have arrived here make to our culture and communities. Refugees are welcome here. Our country is richer for the diversity that you have brought. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. And